Genesis chapter 3. Would you? Genesis chapter 3 in the scripture. Genesis chapter 3. And as you're turning, all the children that are dismissed for junior church, sixth grade and down, is that right? Yes, sir. All the children? Thank you. That's okay. Yep. All the children, sixth grade and down, can be dismissed for children's Bible time. Genesis chapter 3 is where your Bibles are open. Need a Bible? Yeah, I might need my Bible. Want my Bible. No, 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 no. <laughs> is it right around there? No, 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 no. I've got it. I've got it. It's around here somewhere. All, kind of Bibles. all right. No, oh, thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, we got it over here. Thank you. How'd you know that? Oh, man, I'll tell you. Good to have sharp folks like this around. That's good. Okay, we got the Bible. Okay, good. <laughs> I need a Bible, but I also need some volunteers, some teenage volunteers. Where are my teenagers? Let me see teenagers here this morning. Let me see a teenager. I got a teenager here. I got a teenager in the back. I got a teenager there. Everybody's not sure. Teenagers are good volunteers. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah in the back. I got a te- couple teenage girls in the back. And how about this young man right here? Yeah, in the hoodie. He raised his hand. He's waving at me. Come on up here. Come on up here. That's good. All these the willing teenage volunteers. Brother Josh. Yeah, two girls in the back. Yeah, yeah. Come on up here. Say one, two, three. Come on, just stand right here. What's your name? Will. Will. I'm not trying to embarrass you. Yeah, how, how tall are you? Uh, I haven't measured recently, but I'm like six five. I don't know. When I grow up, I'm going to be as tall as Will. That's good. And what's your name? Elena and Hala. Hala. That's right. I always, I always want to call you Kayla. Now I need one more. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, in the back. Oh, she's holding a baby. Oh, right here. I didn't even see this young man right here. He's standing there waving at me the whole time. That's really good. You stand on this side here. Come on, stand this side. Tell me your name again. Elena. Elena. That's right. And what's your name? Olamide. What is it? Olamide. Olamide. Okay, good. All right, now. I've got these guys up here because I need some good volunteers to illustrate something. You know, I believe that feelings are something we talk uh, very little about and we need to talk a little bit more about. And maybe we need to talk a little bit more about in church. Now, we appeal to the brain in church and we should. And that should be our, our, one of our fundamental basis for, basis for our, our choices and our actions. Uh, and we, we have our, our mind, and then we have our emotions and our will. You know, these are the three parts of your soul. Do you know that? The Bible teaches that we're three partite beings. We are body, soul, and spirit. Our body is the shell. What we see is what we have in common with the plants and animals. Our, our spirit, our, our soul, is what we have in, in common with just the animals. Uh, not, not an eternal soul, but... They have a mind, and they have emotions, and they have a will. They, they use it differently than, than we would, but similarly in many ways. And then our spirit. Our spirit is what sets us different from, uh, different from the plants and the animals. And that spirit is that God-shaped place that only Jesus Christ can fill. And when we, we were in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God said, God said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. We'll touch on that in a moment, right? Well, what died? Their body didn't die. They, they still lived for quite some time. They bore children. They went on and lived with their body. Their body was still alive. Their soul didn't die. Their soul, as far as their, their mind, emotions, and will, they still had a way to think and a way to feel and, and a way to choose. But their spirit died. And when the Bible says you must be born again, he's t- Jesus is specifically talking in reference to our spirit that needs to be quickened. That means made alive. And the reason that this world is in such a mess is because many people have not been born again. Their spirit is still dead and they try to f- stuff down in that God-shaped hole, that spirit. They try to stuff in their spirit riches and that doesn't work. And they try to stuff in that spirit relationships and, and as good as relationships are, that doesn't work. They try to stuff in that spirit. They try to stuff pleasure or fame or intellect or, or reason, and that doesn't work. The only thing that will fit in that God-shaped hole is God. Right. Amen. And when he is placed in his proper place 
on the throne, if you will, of our hearts when we receive him as our Savior and our Lord, instantly life makes sense. There are dozens in this room that can testify that they, life didn't make sense until they got saved. And when they got saved, when they were born again, when they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, all of a sudden everything made sense. Now watch this. Now your soul can function properly. Your mind, your emotions, and your will. Now your body actually can, can actually function properly. Now, now your, your spirit can function properly because it's made alive. But part of your emotions or your soul is your mind, your emotions, and your will. We talk about our mind. And I think sometimes we skip over our emotions to go to our will. But our emotions are a pretty big part. Our, our emotions are a pretty big part. And our feelings, our feelings, that's, that's what I'm aiming at. Are you all with me on this? You understand what I'm saying? These fine-looking teenagers. Man, a lie. This is the future of our country and a future of Kendall Park Baptist Church. That's great. All right, now, uh, so w when we talk about feelings, we look at our face, right? Like if I were to give you, if I were to ask you, Hala, to show me a, a sad feeling. Ah, oh, right away she pushes the Gucci lip out, right? Maybe you have practice with that. <laughs> all of us do, all of us do. How about if I were to ask you to show me a... Um, a happy face, what would you show? Ah, oh, she's got a smile. We look at our face for our feelings, right? If I were to show you worried, what would you say with worried? How would you say worried? See, he raises his eyebrows. You know, they say there's about 55,000 different facial expressions. We're not going through all of them today. If I were to say stressed, what would you show on your face stressed? How could you? A smile? Okay, well, this guy right here needs to be the example, all right? He's dealing with stress, just chill. He's chilling. Okay, good. All right. But I brought you guys up here for a second, and I want you to tell me, this will be a quick test, what you feel. Okay? Can you hold that for me? All right. Can you hold, uh, can you hold that for me? All right. Forgive this primitive illustration. We'll get it. Y'all you, you pray for me. Okay. We'll get it. Hold on. All right. Oh, there we go. There we go. Somebody's praying for me. All right, put your hand out. All right. Okay, now I want you to tell me, what does that feel like? Cold. I want you to tell me, what does this feel like? Painful. Pain, oh, painful. Okay. <laughs> Painful, <laughs> pokey, painful, good. What does that feel like? What does that feel like? I don't really feel much. You don't feel much? What does this feel like? Uh, what does that feel like on that side? Sticky. Oh, all right, sticky. Oh, I'll give these guys a round of applause. Just put all that down. Thank you. That's it. Isn't that great? See, that was painless. Thank you. You can just set that down in the front. Right? My dad recently went to the doctor and... Uh, he went to the doctor, and one of the things they did was they were testing his feeling. This isn't good, but they poked around on his toes. They said, do you feel like that? you feel that? No. Do you feel that? I don't know if it's neuropathy or whatever it is. Do you feel this? And they got all the way up to here and poking around. Do you feel that? No. So we've got issues we've got to deal with. And what was that that the doctor used to test? He tested feeling. Now, I'm not sure exactly why, but we're, we're afraid of emotions, I think. Uh, emotions are an essential part of who we are, but they can be messy and complicated and just confusing sometimes. Uh, emotions are a, a big deal. Uh, someone said that a recent study suggested there are 27 categories of emotions, but then there are five main types of emotions who offer a good framework for breaking down the complexity of all the feelings. I think sometimes we're afraid of it. Yeah, we're afraid of it in a, in a Bible preaching church like this. And, and I think there's some concern and good reason because we don't want wildfire to break out. But I can assure you that wildfire in a Bible-believing Baptist church is not a threat. <laughs> it's just not. <laughs> it's like being concerned about a flood in the Sahara. It's not going to happen. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, but, but I think we're concerned about our emotions being uh, out of check. 
But our emotions are such a huge part of life. And our feelings are such a huge part of life. So I say all of that to say this. I want to ask you today, what does sin feel like? I'm not talking about the intellectual part of it. I'm not even getting to the will quite yet. But in this middle component of our soul, our emotions, what does sin feel like? That's a question I want you to consider. And I want to go to just a few passages in the Bible to answer that question. We begin in Genesis chapter 3. Lord, help me as I preach this morning to preach clearly and powerfully. And may everyone here be helped as a result of our time in your word. And we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible teaches us that, that, that there was an attack. The devil began to show his intention with the human race. And it says that now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, let me just stop for a moment and say that what the devil is saying right now is in direct contradiction to what God said in Genesis 2 and verse 16. And God said, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And now we find the devil, or Satan, possessing this serpent. And Eve obviously wasn't afraid of the serpent. Men and beasts lived in perfect harmony up to that point. So Eve wasn't afraid of the serpent. Uh, she was talking to the serpent, and the serpent was talking to her, and, and that obviously wasn't alarming to her. Uh, back then, I think there may very well, before the fall, have been ways that the animals and humans communicated that we don't even understand now. And so, so she's talking to the serpent, and the serpent, the first thing that this, this devil-possessed serpent, this Satan-possessed serpent said is, Yea, hath God said. Do you know the first thing the devil's going to do when he comes into your life is he's going to get you to question the word of God? He is going to put a question mark where God has put a period. And don't let him. And the way you don't let him is you turn away from his conversation. The best thing you could do is not engage in a conversation with the devil. He will outwit you. He will outlogic you. He will outthink you. He will outreason you. Not once, but every single time. Every single time. And so he's questioning the word of God. And now the Bible says he is contradicting the word of God. Ye shall not surely die. God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, you will be as gods. Your eyes will be opened. Now, isn't that what our world says right now? Hey, follow our lie and your eyes will be opened. The problem with you crazy uh, Bible-believing Christians is, is you're so closed-minded. You need to be more open-minded to every thought. And we'll be more open-minded to every thought, except Bible-believing Christianity. I mean, <laughs> we'll set that aside. And, and, and you need to be more tolerant and open-minded of everybody. You see how that is? Well, now, I know where I'm speaking. I'm not speaking very far from a university that teaches these things. Now watch here. He says, ye shall be as gods. And, they, and she bought it. So she took some of this fruit and she sliced it up. And she probably put a little sugar. Everything tastes better with sugar. And a little butter. Everything tastes better with butter. Oh, we had baklava last night. How many of you have ever had baklava? This is the honest truth, Miss Candace. I was driving into New Jersey and saying, oh, I sure hope I get some baklava. There was somebody that made me baklava once in New Jersey before. And lo and behold, the ladies had baklava. I almost melted down and didn't serve and sit and eat all the baklava. Man, that was wonderful. And you know why baklava is so good? Because there's lots of butter. Am I right? Miss Gannon, lots of butter. Oh, it was wonderful. How about it? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who, but there was one particular server that just had baklava for the first time, and it just changed his life, didn't it? Amen. Can I get a witness right there? <laughs> and so, so here, here it, it, they, they, he probably put a little butter on it, probably a little sugar, and, and uh, then she served it for dessert. 
to her husband. I mean, you wouldn't serve the main course because he's never seen it before. But I got a surprise for you when dessert comes, honey. And he says, wow, this is great. He's already had a veggie burger. And, uh, and, uh, and now, now he's got some baklava. They didn't, have, uh, they, they didn't have burgers back then. I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, now they have some, some delicious dessert. And what is it? Well, honey, I just want you to take a bite and see. And he tastes a bite of this delicious uh, fruit. What is fruit? It's some kind of fruit. Wow, yummy. And, and as soon as he ate it, and as soon as she ate it, they knew something was wrong. The taste probably was good. But there was something bad wrong. Honey, what, this, I, I have mixed feelings right now. I, I, I taste so good, but I feel so bad. I, I've never felt this way before. What, what is this? Oh, oh, she said, honey, this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Hmm, that's interesting. And he tastes another bite. He was as complicit as she was because he should have been protecting her. But, but he was not protecting her. And now in the passage, all of a sudden, they feel the very first awful feeling they've ever felt. There was no sadness before this. There was no sickness. There was no shame. There was no worry. There was no concern. There was no bad feeling ever before this. This is the first bad feeling in the history of the universe, in the history of man's universe. And now notice what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 3, as she ate it, the Bible says in verse number 7, the eyes of them both were opened. Oh, her, her eyes were opened. So were his. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. All right, aprons. Number one, I want you to stand this morning with me in the garden and feel the shame of sin. We're asking the question, what does sin feel like? It feels like shame. And when you stand in the garden, you can feel with them the shame of sin. Again, they're eating it. Sin tastes good. If it didn't taste good, nobody would want it. It tastes good. And the devil is glad to make sure that it tastes good and that you know that it tastes good. Sin has an appeal. The Bible speaks of the pleasures of sin. They are for a season. There's no doubt that it tastes good. It tastes good, but then there's this awful feeling that accompanies it. And what does sin feel like? I want you to stand in the garden and feel the shame of sin. Now, I'm not trying to be inappropriate here, but I'm speaking plainly from the Bible. What is the problem? They are a husband and wife. God made them so. They're standing in the garden. There's no one else in the world at the time. They're the only two people that live on the planet. What's wrong with them being naked? We would say, well, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. There is nothing wrong with that. So why are they feeling ashamed? Why are they feeling a problem? And this is, like, this is like the greatest honeymoon ever. It's just them. Here's the problem. Is their conscience has just been awakened. And they have sinned against God. And they have disobeyed his word. And they have taken of what God told them not to take. They could have had the strawberry patch and the pineapple patch and the mango grove and the uh, citrus grove and the apple orchard and watermelon patch. They could have had any fruit of the garden that they had wanted, but they took of the one thing that God told them not to take. And that's, by the way, where God wants to meet you. That may be where God is. That's, by, by the way, where the devil wants to meet you. He wants to meet you at the one thing you can't have and to the exclusion of all that you can have. He wants you to focus on that. He wants you to want it. He wants you to covet it. He wants you to blame God because he's not being good, because he's not allowing you to have what you want. He's, he's wanting to meet you right there and tell you all these lies about God and lies about his word. And, and when you go ahead and eat of that fruit, everyone here has experienced this feeling. We feel the good. We experience the good taste of sin and yet the bad feeling, the shame. Now they're ashamed because they're naked. And what's the first thing they do? They go and they make fig leaves. Now, that couldn't have been a comfortable garment. <laughs> Is there anybody here that has a fig tree in your yard? I have a fig tree, and it blooms, and it's really tall now. It's got lots of figs on it every fall, and it's, it's a, a wonderful tree. But it couldn't have been very, it couldn't have been, it couldn't have looked good. It, I mean, they're, they're, they're with nervous hands grabbing some kind of a vine or some, something, and they're, 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 they're poking holes, and they're trying to attach it together, and, and they're wearing it. They're, they're covering their nakedness. Why? Because they feel what sin makes you feel, and that is ashamed. 
They know that God is coming for his daily walk or his weekly walk. And they're going to have to go into the presence of God naked. Well, there was no problem before because he was their creator. And there was nothing inappropriate before. But somehow there's something inappropriate now. Somehow they feel the shame of sin. Listen to me. Every time you put on clothes and walk out... You remember that this began as a result of sin and our shame. And we're covering our shame. And that theme is born all the way through the Bible. What what do you feel and what does sin feel like? Well, number one, it feels feels like shame. Would you say that with me? It feels like shame. Shame. Would you say it again? It feels like shame. And shame accompanies us now. We do what's wrong and we disobey God and we disregard his word and we just live however we want to live and we act in absolute contrast to the Ten Commandments and to God's holy word and we feel the shame of it all. All of us know what that feeling is. I mean, we can observe that this world is sinful because of, of, of all the things that happened. What happened in Buffalo yesterday was sinful and awful and terrible and it's the symptom of man's problem, its greatest problem, which is sin, and it has a solution. But we're looking everywhere and anywhere except. So here come the gun rights activists, and they're going to be against guns. And here come the people that are acting like, uh, you know, we shouldn't have social media. And certainly what was done and how it was done was just brazen and shameful. But the fact of the matter is, is everybody's going to provide a solution. And I guarantee you in the next 24 hours, there are going to be very few solutions that get to the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter isn't social media. The heart of the matter isn't guns. The heart of the matter isn't uh, white supremacy. The heart of the matter isn't racism. The heart of the problem is sin, dark and dirty and wicked sin. And we can all feel the shame of it right now. Number one, you stand in the garden and feel the shame of sin. But wait, I want you to look at Genesis chapter 4. Now, Adam and Eve are, are, are now parents. Verse number one, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, they've already experienced the shame of it all. God came and he cursed the serpent and he cursed the earth and he brought judgment upon man and upon a, a woman. And there's going to be certain things that accompany it. The woman is going to bear children in sorrow. Uh, The man is going to work by the sweat of his brow. There's going to be thorns and thistles and all the bad things that accompany uh, just the the, the work. Before there was work, but now there's work and pain. And and, and, uh, and no doubt before there was childbearing and was going to be childbearing, but now there's childbearing and pain and sometimes loss and sadness. Now they bear a child. She again bear his brother, verse 2, Genesis 4, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. Stop for just a second. One of the reasons why I'm in Genesis this morning is I'm trying to get to the very heart of it. And Genesis is the, is the book of beginnings. And Genesis sets precedent for all the rest of the Bible. It's the beginning of time. It's the beginning of creation. It's the beginning. It sets precedent. And so now we have a precedent for sin. And now we're going to have a precedent for dealing with sin. I was talking to a man just right after COVID had come. I I was like, we were three weeks into COVID and we had just finished a meeting in Washington, D.C. that was thoroughly affected by COVID. Uh, And then uh, we left and we're going down to North Carolina. We're going to have an outdoor meeting in our cars. I don't don't know if you all had that, but we all had that down in North Carolina. And and, uh, we spent the night because my trailer broke down in a hotel just north of Richmond. And... While we were staying there, I was talking to the young man at the desk. And he was a fine, upstanding young man. He was Hindu in his background. And I really looked forward to just talking to him. So we talked and I asked him questions about the Hindu religion. And he was very devout and very, he seemed like a very upstanding young man. And he told me about all the gods that the Hindus worshipped and how they're divided equally under certain major gods. And, and, uh, and I asked him, I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, what? What is the Hindu solution for the sin problem? I said, is there such a thing as sin in the Hindu religion? Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. And I said, well, what's the solution? Well, he gave me typically what you would expect. Well, you know, you do good and you, that's good karma. You, you don't do bad and, and all of this very much a works-based kind of thing. I said, well, I said, can you tell me what is considered a sin in the Hindu religion? And he said, Oh, 
uh, killing an animal. I said, that's, that's not allowed. Oh, no, no, no. You're not allowed to eat animals. You're not allowed to, not, not allowed to, to kill animals. That's a terrible thing because they believe in reincarnation. That might be some relative or whatever, and it'd just be an awful thing. And I'm sure there are more and deeper ideas in involved than that. I said, you know, that's very interesting. I said, the Bible says something completely different. He said, really? I said, yes. I said, did you know that in the Bible, the Bible teaches that the very first thing that died in the Bible and in the history of man was an animal? He said, really? And I said, do you know who killed it? He said, no. I said, God. <gasps> he didn't know what to say. <laughs> well, why? Why? I asked him, why did God kill an animal? Ah, let's look at it. The Bible says that Abel brought, verse 4, the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So God respected, uh, God respected Abel and his offering. Why? Because he killed an animal. But that's not the first thing that died. The first thing that died was when God, in Genesis chapter 3, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, what the Bible says in verse 21, unto Adam also and to his wife and the Lord God, make, did the Lord God make them coats of skins and clothe them? And that's a picture of salvation. Now, I'm not going to go too deeply into it, but God was the one that took away their fig leaf aprons and covered them with animal skins. Why? Because that shows that man's righteousness and man's religion and man's good works are not going to satisfy God. There must be the death of a substitute and the death of a sacrifice. There must be. And so God killed an animal, covered them with the coats and skins of that animal, and took away their fig leaf aprons. So Adam and Eve knew from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21 that, that God would be pleased when there was the bloody death of a substitute and a sacrifice. And they taught that to Cain and Abel. Now Cain and Abel are grown, and Cain and Abel have an opportunity to bring their sacrifice before the Lord. It was the time that they were to bring sacrifices. Abel brought a lamb. He was a shepherd. Cain brought the fruit of the ground, a fruit basket. Probably went down to Walmart and got one. And uh, he got him a nice fruit basket, and he brought it before the Lord. And when he brought it before the Lord, the Lord said, no, I'm not okay with that. But to Abel's sacrifice, which was a blood sacrifice, a lamb that was slain and killed, and the blood was flowing, the scripture says that God respected it. Verse number four, it says, The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, verse five, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. That means he got angry, and he was not happy. He was kind of like the poochy lip that Hala described for us, only it was way worse. It was way worse. Uh, in verse number five, verse number six, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel. Watch this now. Think of this from Adam and Eve's perspective and from Abel's perspective. Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. What does sin feel like? Number one, you stand in the garden and you feel the shame of sin. But number two, you stand at the grave and feel the sadness of sin. What does sin feel like? It feels like sadness. Now again, the world and religion will not offer you any good explanation for these things. They're not going to do it. Uh, Pastor, I've told people many times, if I weren't a Bible-believing Christian, I would be an atheist. Because nothing else makes sense. But I can't be an atheist, and you know why? It doesn't make sense. Atheism provides no reasonable explanation for or solution to sin, suffering, and death. Where we all live. We all live with sin, suffering, and death. There's no reasonable explanation for or solution to sin, suffering, and death. I mean, honestly, you listen to an atheist for a while, and you feel like you're listening to an alien. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. 
Why? They don't have an explanation for or a solution to sin, suffering, and death. So what should I say that f- sin feels like? Number one, I stand in the garden and I feel the shame of sin. Number two, I stand at the grave and feel the sadness of sin. Adam and Eve buried their son Abel. Can you imagine the sadness that they felt with every shovel full of dirt? Can you imagine the sadness they felt when they first discovered that Abel was dead? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the sadness they felt when they looked at Cain and they figured out that Cain was the one that had killed his own brother? Can you imagine imagine the sadness they felt when they realized they were the cause of all of this by their choice? You stand at the grave, and everyone here has stood at a grave at some time or another, and your tears have coursed down your cheek and dropped on the ground below, and you know what it is to experience loss and suffering and goodbyes, and you wish that it wouldn't be, and you wonder what was the last thing you said to them, and you wish that you could go back and maybe redo, redo some things, but you can't. There's a finality to death. There is a struggle to death. There is a sadness to death. And everyone here that has lived for any length of time knows and experiences that that sadness. Adam and Eve must have felt it fresh like no one else before. What does sin feel like? Number one, sin feels like shame. Number two, sin feels like sadness. Would you say that? Sin feels like sadness. Would you say it again? Sin feels like sadness. But I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Judges chapter 16. That's to the right. You'll turn to Judges chapter 16, a good many books. You'll find Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You'll find Joshua and then Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16 tells us of a great, a great servant of God who had killed a lion with his own hands. He had, he had killed Philistines who were the enemies of the people of God. He had stood for what was right. He was a judge of Israel. That means he was a leader of Israel. But somehow he had gotten off track little by little. Usually you don't get off track suddenly. Usually it's, it's, it's subtly, not suddenly. And in Judges chapter 16, he had gotten off track. Uh, Delilah is the lady that is enticing him. And the scripture tells us that she entices him because the Philistines offered her a whole lot of money. She was thinking a lot of new shoes or maybe a new renovation to her apartment, uh, maybe a new Magnolia makeover or whatever it is. And she says, boy, I I could really use a little extra cha-ching. And so so she she entices him. She's got real motivation here. And and she, she says, what's the secret of your strength? They didn't know the secret of his strength. And he hadn't told anybody. It was a secret. And he starts to reveal the secret. And, and uh, she, she calls the Philistines to come in and, and to implement these uh, measures upon him. And none of it worked. He was lying to her, leading her on. And so now she's frustrated and she cries. She turns on the spigot. And you know, what do you do when a woman cries? Men, what do you do when a woman cries? There's nothing you can do when a woman cries. There's absolutely nothing. And so she's using this as a manipulative tool to get to him. And finally it wears him down, wears him down, wears him down. And he does reveal the secret of his strength. It was in his hair. He was a Nazarite. So he was an exception to the rule. He was consecrated unto God, and he had never let a razor touch his head. He said, if you take a razor to my head, then then he said, my strength will be gone. I'll be as any other man. Why he did it, we've never known, and and, and yet he did it. And so she lulled him to sleep, and she cut off his hair, and, and she said, Samson, the Philistines be upon me. Now, before when she said that, he'd wake up, he'd break off the chains and the fetters, and he'd put a hurting on this, the, the Philistines. This time, he woke up, and he said, I'll go out as at other times before, and he couldn't. And he wished not that the Spirit of God was upon him. Look at Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16 and verse number 18. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up at once, for for he hath showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. And she made him sleep on, on her knees. And she called for a man. And she caused him to shave off, caused him to shave off the locks of his head. And she began to afflict him. And his strength went from him. 
And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not. That means he knew not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. What does sin feel like? Listen to me. Listen to me. I want you to stand in the prison and feel the shackles of sin. Sin feels like guilt. Sin feels like bondage. Sin feels like shackles. What does it feel like? It feels like shame. You know it in the garden. What does it feel like? It feels like sadness. You feel it at the grave. What does sin feel like? It feels like shackles. If it did not, and if there was no bondage with sin, we wouldn't have to have prisons. But we have prisons. Last week, there was a prison just a mile or two away from where we were at. Big, huge, sprawling complex, barbed wire everywhere, men in cells, some in solitary confinement, some in shackles that had just gotten there. Why all that? Because of sin! And now Samson feels it. Once the mighty Samson that had killed giants and killed Philistines and killed uh, other mighty men, killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. Now Samson is blinded with hot searing irons and his hands are tied and shackles around his feet and shackles around his, his shoulders and he's grinding round and round and round in a grist mill doing what an oxen or a donkey would do. What does sin feel like, Samson? What? Samson, over here. What? We're asking, what does sin feel like? Oh, oh, it feels like shackles. Jonah said as much in Jonah chapter 2 when God put him in the most unique prison of all time, the belly of a fish. And he said, the earth with her bars was wrapped around me. Jonah, what does sin feel like? It feels like shackles. We wouldn't have to have recovery programs if it weren't addictive and if it weren't shackles. Some of you know people, maybe dear loved ones, that are absolutely addicted to drink and alcohol and drugs and their lives have been wrecked and ruined. Education won't solve that. Money won't solve that. We've poured millions of dollars at the drug problem. It hasn't solved the drug problem. Why? Because the drug problem isn't a money problem. And it's not an education problem. It's a heart problem. Maybe there's somebody in this room right now who feels the shackles. And you're either on the verge or you're well into addiction. What does sin feel like? It feels like shackles. Now I want you to turn with me quickly to Gen John chapter number 19. John chapter number 19 in the New Testament far to your right you'll come to Matthew Mark Luke and John chapter 19 quickly quickly we're almost done John chapter 19 I want us to figure out what sin feels like today John chapter 19 I want to draw your attention down in John chapter 19 and I want you to see what the Bible says in John 19 and verse number verse number 16 then delivered he up there, him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two other with him, and either side one, on either side one Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, right? Uh, but, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the 
cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. This is where Jesus Christ died, on the cross. I want you to know what sin feels like this morning and feel it yourself. I want you to stand with Adam and Eve in the garden and feel the shame of sin. I want you to stand with Adam and Eve and Cain at the graveyard of Abel, at the funeral of Abel, and feel the sadness of sin. I want you to stand with Samson in the prison and feel the shackles of sin. And I want you to stand at the cross. And see the bloody form of Jesus as he hung and bled and died. Blood flowing from his hands and from his feet and from his brow and all down his back. And I want you to see that Jesus Christ died for you and me. Number four, I want you to see that stand at the cross and feel the stain of sin. Because it's at the cross we see that Jesus took the stain for ourselves. He took the stain for us and bore it to himself. The stain of sin. Now, everyone here knows what it is to have some stain that you can't get out. And and, and you're thinking, how am I going to get this out? And you ladies have become experts at trying this soap or that detergent or something else. And uh, you try to get rid of that stain. Now, I want you to think about this. In the Old Testament, we called called this sacrifice of of the lamb, it was an atonement. But in the New Testament, when we refer to Jesus, we refer to it as the atonement because there's nothing else that needs to be done. Now, let me explain it this way. In the Old Testament, it was just a covering because atone means to cover. And if I were at your house right now and I were eating and uh, I was reaching across to get the the vegetables and I dump uh, some cranberry sauce or or some other kind of juice on the table, you you look and say, oh, man, I I look and I say, oh, man, I get my napkin and I dab it up. And you say, hey, no worries at all. Don't worry. You're a guest at our house. Just 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 sit down and eat and we'll take care of it. And so you dab it all up and leave it. But while I'm eating my vegetables and my mashed potatoes and my 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 broccoli and cheese i keep looking over at that stain you say no don't worry about that i don't worry about that brother Dwight. it's no big deal i say oh i'm so sorry i i'm so clumsy i just need a little bit more coordination in my life and he said no 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 it's no problem and so you see this problem and so you say look it's all right so you move everything aside and you take a napkin that matches the tablecloth and you cover it watch now and then you move everything back do you know what that's called atonement But after the meal is over, you clear the table and you take that tablecloth and you spot treat it and you put it in the wash and wash the stain away. Look at me. That is what Jesus did. Jesus is described as the Lamb of God. Watch this. Which taketh away the sin of the world. It says for every priest and a daily oftentimes offered, offers oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man, when he had offered himself as a sacrifice, sat down at the right hand of God. He offered himself as a sacrifice once for all. In other words, it's paid for. It's washed away. Jesus did what the Old Testament sacrifices said he would do but could not do themselves. Wash Away the stain. What kind of a facial expression would you have if you had a stain? Ah, oh, how did that happen? What am I going to do now? I'm just about to come to an important event and I got this stain. Ah, you're frustrated. You come to Jesus and all of that frustration turns to peace because he takes the stain of our heart away. Amen. All right, turn to Gen- John 20 quickly and we're through. Verse number one, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then come a Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple 
which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. I want you to stand at the empty tomb. Watch this. And feel salvation from sin. You see, if you and I want to ask the question, what does sin feel like? We stand at the grave and feel the shame of sin. We stand at the, t at, the, at, the, at, the, at the garden and feel the shame. We stand at the grave and we feel the sadness of sin. We stand in the prison and we feel the shackles of sin. We stand at the cross and we feel the stain of sin because Jesus bore our stain in his own body on the tree. And then we stand at the resurrection. Now, you can't have the crucifixion without the resurrection, not and have salvation. The reason we have salvation is not just because of the crucifixion, but also because of the resurrection. Jesus had to die the way he died, and he shed his precious red royal blood, and it was the very thing that would make a complete cleansing for the stain of sin. But when we stand at the empty tomb, we know he's the one. There's many tombs that I've stood at. Many graves, some above ground, some below ground, and I've stood to honor the dead, but none of them have been empty except the grave where Jesus was. And because the grave is empty, he proved everything that he said was true. He proved that he was God. He proved that he's the only one that has the authority and the ability to save you or me. You see, Kendall Park Baptist Church doesn't have the ability to save you. I don't have the ability to save you. Only Jesus Christ does. Only the one with nail prints in his hands and his feet and a pierced side. Only the one who died was buried and rose again. And I'm saying to you that if you'll come to the grave and you'll realize not Buddha and not, uh, not Confucius and, and not Stalin or Lenin and, and not uh, all of the Hindu prophets or priests and not Allah, but only Jesus Christ died, was buried and rose again. And as such, he's the only one that can save you. If you'll come to him and believe on him today, He'll save you. John saw and believed. Will you believe? Will you believe today? Will you trust Jesus Christ? There are people in this room who've believed in days gone by when we've been here before. And in recent days, will you believe? Jesus asked Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, he that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And I ask you, believest thou this? Will you believe that Jesus died and rose again? If you will do that and accept him as your savior today, he will save you and give you eternal life and wash away your sin stain and take away the sadness because there's hope through the resurrection and take away your shackles because there's freedom through the truth of God and take away your shame and replace it with an absolute freedom and an absolute joy. Will you accept him as your savior today? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Thank you for your attention to the word of God. I wonder with your heads bowed and your eyes closed if you'd say, Brother Dwight, I know for a fact that as you preach today, God has saved my soul, that I'm on my way to heaven. But there's somebody that God's laid on my heart and burdened my heart for as you've been preaching that needs Christ and that needs salvation. Would you pray with me for them that they would be saved and pray that I would be courageous and bold in my witness toward them? If that's you, would you slip your hand up right now? God's laid someone on your heart. Good. Okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Is there anyone else? God's spoken to your heart. Question number two. I wonder as a Christian if you'd say, Brother Smith, I'm saved, but God's convicted me about some area of sin in my life that I need to confess and forsake. Would you pray with me that I'd get it right? If that's you, would you slip up your hand? Is there anybody here like that? Thank you. All right. Praise the Lord. Two more questions. How many of you would say, Brother Dwight, there are certain things I don't know, but there's one thing I do know. If I died today, I'd go to heaven. If I died five years from now, I'd go to heaven because I have accepted Jesus Christ and believed that he died and rose again. And I know, not wish or hope or think, but know that I'm on my way to heaven. If that's you, would you slip your hand up high? Preacher, I know for a fact, if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Slip it up and keep it up just for a moment. Preacher, I know for a fact, if I died today, I'd be on my way to heaven. Thank you. Thank you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I want to ask, is there anybody here that said, Brother Dwight, I don't know that. I can feel the shame of sin and its sadness and its shackles and its stain. And I need forgiveness. And I know that Jesus is the only one that can offer it, truly offer it forever. 
If that's you and you said, Preacher, would you pray for me? I couldn't raise my hand a moment ago, but I would like to know for sure that my sins are forgiven and that my home is heaven. Would you just slip your hand up right now? Is there anybody in this building like that? I'll not embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Anyone at all, Preacher, pray for me. Pray for me. I don't know that I'm saved, but I want to know that my sins are forgiven and my home is heaven. If you're listening by way of live stream and you don't know Christ as your Savior, today you can if you'll put your faith in Him and believe that He died and rose again. Let's stand, shall we, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, how thankful we are that you've taught us a little bit today about what sin feels like. Help us, Lord, to take this matter seriously. Help us to flee sin, to confess our sin, to forsake it, to replace it with righteousness. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd help anyone here and anyone listening that doesn't know Christ today to believe on Christ. I pray that each one of us would seek to be right with you with our own heart and we'll thank you and praise you. I'm just going to ask the pianist to play a few verses of Only Trust Him. And as she does, God's spoken to your heart. Would you come? Just come. The altar's open. And I want you to come and get things right with the Lord. Would you do that right now? The altar's open. I want to encourage you to come and get things right. Maybe pray for that lost loved one that you're burdened for. I'm praying with you for them. Would you come? The altar's open. Now's the time. are bowed, eyes are closed. I'd like us to sing this song if we could. We'll just sing the first verse and then pastor will come and close as he sees fit. The altar's still open if you need to come, come now. Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord and He will surely give you rest by trusting in here and I hope all have partaken of that and if not today could be the day of salvation I pray you won't leave the same as you came if salvation is the need of the hour and again to those that are watching uh, it's the same message I hope that you'd write us or call us and let us know about your need we'd be glad to reach out and help you we're thankful for again a good morning we're looking forward to another hour of this or at least another 45 minutes or so uh, we're going to stay upstairs here in the auditorium seventh grade and above for our life group hour uh, sixth grade and under can head down to their church or to their uh, life group hour downstairs. We're going to take about a five minute, seven minute break and get started here. So if you want to be dismissed at this time, just to use the restrooms or whatever, that'd be great. Enjoy the fellowship with those around you. But we're going to get started in about seven minutes, seventh grade and above up here and the kids downstairs. Thanks for being with us. Lord bless you.